Hello, Chapel Street Church, and thanks for worshiping with us today. If you're new with us, we invite you to go to our Welcome Center after the service so we can meet you and perhaps answer any questions you may have. Here are a few things we wanted to let you know about. Our annual meeting will be held on Saturday, September 14th at our Kessinger campus. This is a time to reflect on what God has done in the past year, hear about plans for the future, and participate in important decisions regarding our church's leadership and budget. Members, your presence and vote are vital. Non-members are welcome to attend as well. Absentee ballots and more information can be found at chapelstreet.church slash annual meeting. Men, this Friday is the first Friday of the fall. Join other men this week at 6 a.m. to share breakfast, hear some stories of God's work in the lives of men around them, and grow in your understanding of God's word. One of the privileges I have is to direct our Shepherd's Heart Ministries. There are hundreds of stories of how God is meeting the needs and changing lives enabled by your generosity. Here are a few of those stories. Well, when I first came in, uh, I literally had to stand at the door and say a serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, the wisdom to know the difference. And I had to ask for some courage to come on through that door. The thing about my faith today is that I know God had it when I walked in the door. It's you never been in a situation where you need food or you don't have the money how to pay your bills yeah. or your things. Cred credit cards. You don't have idea how horrible is that feeling. A man especially doesn't feel like a man when he is not able to put food on the table. And a mom, when she ain't got food for her baby, you know what I'm saying, she figures she ain't the correct mom. I think that the, the people here, the way they, they treat you is, walking in here is like going to a store and it's like, how can God give so much to me? I see God's spirit moving around here. When I see uh, certain people come in the door and they come in with grudges, you know, with attitudes, right? And by the time they get through shopping and they leaving out the door praising, praising God and thanking you, you know, that's when I know the spirit of God is at work. We have to put our pride aside sometimes to ask for the help. And I know how a lot of people feel coming in that door, you know, and to have the courage to come through here and ask for some help, you know. If you ain't asking God's people, who else you gonna ask? When you hear the word church, and what's the first thing you think of, and I thought the same thing for years, you think of a beautiful building and a steeple and stained glass windows. That's what you think of when you hear church. But actually, the, the staff, the volunteers, the people are the spine and the soul of the church. So they're the ones that nurture you and embrace you and make you feel it's going to be okay. Is these people who don't believe in God, for example, or they don't go to some place, what happens when they came here and you are nice and you are a good person and you are smiling and enjoy what do you do? They feel good. These people have something I want to have with me all the time, you know, and I think that, was, that part is very important too. My husband had a dementia for 10 years. So the hardest thing other than the debt is the loneliness and the rejection from people that are supposed to love you. When I came here, they, they embraced me so much and the, the rejection that I had for so many years, I kind of forgot about it because you know kind, kindness can cure almost anything and the kindness that they gave me was immeasurable and the gratefulness I feel is something I could never ever repay. So walking in these doors and the hugs and the smiles was something I needed so desperately. This is a wonderful, wonderful place. Well, good morning and praise the Lord for all that he is doing through Shepherd's Heart. And we want to thank each and every one of you who have been a part of this meaningful ministry, whether through your giving or as a volunteer. You are the hands and feet of Christ 
to thousands of people who have walked through those doors and countless more who will walk through those doors, Lord willing, in the days to come. And it's wonderful to see just a small glimpse of the impact that ministry is having on both families and individuals in need. If you would, please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, we will be looking at the last four verses of the chapter today. And as you are turning there, I'll ask you a quick question. How many of you have ever driven past your childhood home or an old home you once owned? (laughs) Okay, (laughs) most of us. Let me ask you, is there a stranger feeling than this experience? (laughs) Several months ago, I drove past the house that I lived in for most of my childhood, and man, was it weird. I noticed that the new owners had removed many of the plants. They painted the front door red. (laughs) And worst of all, they got rid of our old basketball hoop, (laughs) which is almost as sad as Chapel Street not having a single basketball hoop on any of their four campuses. But that is another story (laughs) for another day. Anyway, when I saw all of these changes to the house, my first thought was something like, wait a second, you can't do that. That's my house. And if we were in a documentary right now, the narrator would say something like, but little did Blake know that they could indeed do that because it was no longer his house, it was theirs. There is something about seeing or thinking about our childhood and our childhood home in particular that for many of us conjures up deep emotions and even longing. Now, maybe for some of you, your childhood home didn't mean much to you, or perhaps it was even a negative environment. And if that's you, let me ask you this alternative question. And I would encourage everyone in this room to feel free to to think uh, of your answer to this question in your mind. Which emotions rise up inside you when you see a picture of someone or something from your past that you deeply miss? Which emotions rise up inside you when you hear a song (laughs) that reminds you of that particular season of your life? Every time we see or think of a person or place or feeling that we wish we could have back, we are experiencing a longing that philosophers call Zainsut which is a German word whose pronunciation I'm probably butchering right now, which means an intense, almost melancholic longing for an idealized place or state, or putting that into simple English, Zainsut is our longing for home. It's a reference to that existential homesickness that every human feels deep down. In fact, if you Google the definition of home, which I did in the last week or two, if you Google the definition of home, here's what you'll get. Home is the place where one lives permanently, especially as a member of a family or household. Now, you'll notice that a true home, any true home, involves three things, right? Place, people, and permanence. And guys, if you are missing any one of these three things, you will feel homeless. You'll feel homesick. You'll feel Zane suit. (laughs) As long as you do not have a place to turn, you'll feel lost. As long as you do not have a people to walk with, you'll feel lonely. And as long as you feel like the place or people you do have could be taken away from you, you will feel deeply insecure. Every human soul longs for a home that lasts, a loving place and people that lasts permanently. But let me ask you, Where in the world can we find this? Where on earth can we satisfy this longing? In fact, maybe let me ask you rhetorically, where are you looking to satisfy this longing? Where is home for you?
whenever we experience a major change or disruption in our lives, we feel this looming question of home, don't we? Whenever you move into a new house, you are reminded that the old place wasn't permanent. That wasn't it. That wasn't the permanent home for which your soul longs. They'll paint the front door red and they'll take away your basketball hoop, trust me. (laughs) Or when your kids go off to college or they get married or you break up with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a loved one passes away we are reminded that those relationships were not permanent, at least not in the way they once existed. They were not the permanent home for which our souls long. You know, and I know deep down that our true home has to be something more than the temporary places and relational circumstances we have experienced in this world. It's got to be more than this. It's got to be more than this. It's almost as if as soon as we look to anything in this world to be our true home, that thing shifts (laughs) or it changes or it leaves us in some way. The people and places in this world refuse, refuse to let us find our eternal home in them. So where is it then? (laughs) Where is the permanent home that we all know deep down we were created for? Where can we find that? Our passage for today points us to three things each of our souls desperately needs and how we can get them. What are those three things? They're up on the screen. In a world full of difficulties and changing circumstances, we all desperately need a permanent place to turn, a permanent people to walk with, and a prevailing promise of something better. And I'll explain that when we get there. Permanent place, permanent people, prevailing promise only by having all three of these things. Will we have a home for our souls that is strong enough to withstand the winds of suffering and change in this life? So would you join me in a word of prayer and then we'll dive into the text. Heavenly Father, it is true, without you we are lost and alone direct and fortify our hearts this morning through your word and by your Holy Spirit and show us Christ this morning. That's why we're here. Show us Christ for his glory and for our hope and joy. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 verses 19 through 22. I will be reading from the English Standard Version and the text will also be up on the screens. And I'm also going to provide some commentary as we read through this so that we can just dive right in afterward. So Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. It says, So then you... You, by the way, is a reference to Gentiles or non-Jewish Christians who are brought into the family of God. So this is a nod to the New Testament church. This is a reference to you and to me. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens. In other words, you are no longer spiritually homeless. (laughs) But you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. In other words, you now have a place and a people. You now have a home. Praise God. Verse 20. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. This is a reference, by the way, to the message of the apostles and prophets, not the people themselves. And what is their message? Their message is the gospel. Who Jesus is and what he has done. This is the foundation on which our faith is built and on which the church is built. All right, verse 20. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So here we have a foundation, which is the testimony of Jesus, and we have a cornerstone, which is the person of Jesus, both of which are permanent and unshakable. Verse 21. In whom, that is in Christ, the whole structure, the structure of the church, is being joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, in Christ, you also are being built together into a dwelling place, or you might say home, for God by the Spirit. Okay, quick reminder, 
before we dive in. Today, we are continuing in our four-week sermon series called What is the Church? And in this series, we are looking at how four biblical metaphors begin to answer this question of what is the church? What is the church? According to God's word, the church is the people of God, and the people of God are described in at least four different ways. Number one, a body, which Pastor Jeff preached on two weeks ago. Number two, a bride, which Pastor Jeff preached on last week. Number three, a building, which we're looking at today. And number four, a priesthood, which we will see next week. And you'll notice in the text we just read that Paul describes the church as two kinds of buildings. Number one, a house built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets' message. And number two, a temple, which is made up of the people of God. And you'll notice, you'll notice that both of these building images have a connotation of home. You see that? A house, that is where we humans live. A temple is where God lives. And through Christ, these two buildings come together into the same home, a dwelling place for God and man. In other words, through this passage, God is saying to you, I want to make my dwelling with you. Wherever you go on this earth, <laughs> I want to go with you. I want to make my home with you and in you eternally. And as we're going to see today, this home is where we find a permanent place, a permanent people, and a prevailing promise. So let's look at these one at a time, beginning with a permanent place. Back when I was in college, uh, I was working a couple of jobs and also going to school, and I had a nightly tradition, a very weird nightly tradition, <laughs> where I would get home at midnight sometimes even later, and instead of going straight to bed, I would, of course, cook up a bunch of pancakes made with oat fiber and defatted peanut butter, which you can ask me about later, and then I would plop down on this comfy chair and watch SportsCenter. Uh, that was my little nightly haven at the end of, of each day, right at the crack of midnight. And here was the great thing, is that I knew every day, no matter how hard school was, <laughs> No matter how hard my work was, no matter how difficult relationships were, I had peanut butter pancakes in Sports Center waiting for me when I got home. <laughs> now, you may think to yourself, that is a weird nightly tradition. <laughs> and, and I won't argue with that, but perhaps you have experienced a similar feeling during a long day or a long week where you have daydreamed of getting home and just relaxing on the couch or perhaps collapsing onto your bed or resting in whatever way you like to rest. Or maybe if you are a stay-at-home mom or you have been, maybe the daydream is just for an hour or two where your kids are out of the house and the house is quiet and you can finally just breathe. And that feeling right there, that decompressing exhale at the end of a long day is a huge part of why we all long for home. What is home? Home is the place we can finally turn to when life gets tough. Home is ground zero. Home is the place of refuge. Home is the place that allows you to finally just breathe, no matter what happens out there in the world. Now, let me ask you, where is home for your soul? Where is ground zero? Where is the place of refuge? What is that thing you can turn to in your mind when you are feeling overwhelmed and remembering that thing allows you to exhale and say, oh yeah, it's going to be okay. What is that for you? You know, it's funny that the passage today describes our, our true home as a temple because many people use the language of sanctuary. Have any of you guys heard this before? <laughs> where someone will say something like, you know, the gym is my sanctuary. That's where I turn when life gets hard. I've, I've been there myself. Or the garden is my sanctuary. That's where I feel the most peace. Or the golf course, that's my sanctuary. That's where I can finally relax. Or my significant other, she is what grounds me in life. She's my sanctuary. Here's the problem. What happens when our sanctuary is taken away from us? 
What happens when we get injured and we can't go to the gym? I was here before, I injured my back for like three years, and there was three years where I just drove past the gym and I looked longingly at it knowing I couldn't have it. Or what happens during the six months of the dark, cold, Illinois winter where you can't get out into the garden in the same way you once could? Or again, what happens when a loved one passes away or leaves us If anything in this material world is serving as the foundation of our sense of home, it's only a matter of time before our sense of home crumbles. So where else can we turn? What what other foundation can we build our lives on? What is that place we can always turn to in our minds when life gets hard that allows our souls to breathe? According to Ephesians 2, the foundation on which we are to build our lives is the message of the apostles and prophets, the testimony of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And you say, wow, that's pretty vague. (laughs) That's pretty vague. Can you remind me, what is this testimony again? What is this testimony of who Jesus is and what he has done? So glad you asked. I love, love the way the Heidelberg Catechism summarizes this testimony of the apostles and prophets, this foundation on which we can build our lives and our faith. This is Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer number one, and this is up on the screen. Christian, what is your only comfort in life and in death? In other words, what is that thing in both life and in death that allows you to exhale and say, it's going to be okay? What is the firm foundation upon which you can build your entire life and even your death? Answer, that I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. Oh, by the way, he also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head (laughs) without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Guys, that is the kind of firm foundation I desperately need in this stormy world. (laughs) This is the kind of firm foundation we all need in this stormy world. And here's what I want us to take away from for this first point. Building your life on the firm foundation of the gospel of Christ does not mean that wind and storms will not come in this life. It means you will not ultimately collapse when they do. Listen listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 7. This is up on the screen. Everyone who hears these words of mine, the testimony of Jesus, and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, it fell and great was the fall of it. A relationship with Jesus does not take away all suffering in this life. It doesn't automatically take away all of the storms. This is something that I have had to learn through nearly 15 years of being a Christian and studying God's word. A relationship with Jesus does not automatically take away all feelings of anxiety or grief or insecurity or regret or embarrassment. <laughs> 
or temptation or unfulfilled longings or pain from broken or lost relationships, a relationship with Jesus does not stop us from experiencing normal human emotions in a broken world. But a relationship with Jesus does give us an unfailing place to turn to, a firm foundation to stand on in hardship so that we do not ultimately collapse when storms come. The main difference The main difference in life with Christ is not less suffering, but an always present help and undying hope in the midst of suffering. Ultimately, our hope comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ, the testimony of the apostles and prophets. This is the place we can turn to when life gets hard, but you say, wait a second, a home is more than just a place, isn't it? Yes, it is. Remember, we need a place, we need people, we need permanence, and that brings us to our second point, a permanent people. How many of you have ever been out of the country for, let's say, a week or longer? Okay, about, about half of us. So you, you guys think back to that experience. Um, and for those of you who have not been, uh, just imagine for a moment, imagine with me, you are on a trip to a far away country. And let's say you're there with your close friend or with a spouse. And let's say that you are there for an indefinite amount of time. You know you're coming back at some point, but you don't know exactly when. Now, none of the people in that language, in, in that country, speak your language. They're, they have a very different cuisine and shockingly no Starbucks. <laughs> Everything is foreign and unfamiliar to you, and some parts are uncomfortable. Now, I would love, honestly, just in this moment right here, I would love to just pause and even talk to each and every one of you individually and be like, what are you feeling right now? Like, I wonder if some people would be like, this sounds amazing, and others are like, this sounds horrible. (laughs) Now, if you are adventurous, if you're adventurous, perhaps you may enjoy this experience for a few days or a few weeks, but I think all of us, after a while, you begin to long for home. You long for your own bed, your own stuff, your own food, everything that is familiar and comfortable to you. But one thing gives you great comfort in the midst of all of the discomfort and unfamiliarity. And what is that? Oh, it's that you have a little piece of your home with you in your friend or in your spouse. You are not doing this alone. And guys, this is exactly what we have in this life with Christ and with the people of God. None of us are truly home yet. We are all foreigners. All of us long to live in a world apart from sin, apart from suffering, apart from evil, in a world full of joy. And until we get that, we are going to feel like foreigners. But here's the good news. The good news is that we have a piece of our eternal home with us right now in Christ and in one another. Christian, if you look around this room, you are seeing people with whom you will spend all eternity in the true home that our hearts and souls were made for. Right now, we can look at each other and say, hey, we're not home yet. And man, it's pretty uncomfortable here sometimes, isn't it? But boy, it sure is sweet to be here with you, to be doing this together until we arrive safely at home. And isn't this what we all crave? (laughs) We all crave not only to not walk alone in this broken world, but we also crave to have a love that lasts. We want to be able to look our loved ones in the eye and say, I am going to know you and I'm going to love you, and I'm going to walk with you for all eternity. Nothing, not even death itself, will separate us from one another and from our love. And this is exactly what we get in Christ and in the church family. At least 10 different times in the four verses we looked at today, the church is described as a familial community. For example, it says we're members of one another. It says we're part of a household. It says we're built together like bricks and mortar into a building. We're with one another through Christ, And only through Christ do we have hope of a permanent community, a permanent family, a permanent people. But I think there's one other thing that troubles each and every one of us deep down. 
One other thing that keeps us from feeling like we're truly home yet, even if we do have a permanent place to turn and a permanent people to walk with. And what is that one thing? This brings us to our final point this morning, which is a prevailing promise or a promise of something better. Here's, here's what I think troubles each and every one of us deep down. Imagine if I were to tell you, don't worry, God has a permanent place for you and a permanent people for you, and it's going to be full of sin and evil and suffering, just like in this world. <laughs> what might you say to that proposition? You might say, Blake, you know what? That does not sound like a definition of home to me. That sounds like a definition of hell. A permanent place and a permanent people full of evil and suffering and death and sorrow. That's not our true home. We need a prevailing promise. We need an assurance that whatever our true home is, it's better than what we have experienced here. Do you know what this world feels like sometimes? Uh, I just told someone this recently. Sometimes, sometimes this world feels like I am a, a fish on the ocean shore. So if you picture me right now, picture me as a fish, um, and you can kind of see my, my big eye like looking out into that eternal ocean for which I was created. That's what it feels like. And most of the time, I'm just gasping, just trying to keep going, trying to stay alive. And every once in a while, the tide comes up just enough for me to okay, okay, and breathe and keep going for another week, another day, another month, and then it's right back to gasping. We all face two problems in this life, two major problems. Number one, the problem of suffering. And number two, the problem of joy. Number one, suffering is a problem because it never seems to end. We are constantly gasping for air. Number two, joy is a problem because it never seems to last. The tides of joy come up for a moment, but then they recede. Then they're gone. If heaven is just, is this life, but just permanently, I don't want to be a part of that. But praise the Lord that the gospel tells us the opposite about our eternal destiny. As we saw last week in Revelation 21, a day is coming when Jesus himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes in death and sorrow and suffering and evil and pain and brokenness will be gone forever, meaning no more gasping. No more gasping. And as for the problem of joy, One of my favorite verses in scripture, Psalm 1611, says, In your presence, O Lord, there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures temporarily, <laughs> momentarily as the tide comes up, At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Forevermore. No more temporary tides of joy. Instead, we will swim forever in the infinite ocean of joy for which we all know we were created. You say, how do I know this is promised to me? Notice verse 22 of our passage today. It says, we are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. There is so much in that verse. I could talk to you for four hours about that, but let me just point out one thing to you, and it's this. Why is this phrase so significant? If you were to flip back one page in your Bible, in Ephesians 1, verses 13 through 14, it says this, and this is up on the screen. What, what does it mean that we have the Holy Spirit in us? In Christ, you are also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Now notice this, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. The Holy Spirit is not only a comforting presence for us in our suffering, but he also is the prevailing promise of an eternal inheritance apart from suffering. Jesus says in John 16, 22, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice, 
and no one will take your joy from you. I'll close with this. Think back. Think back for a moment to that picture of the person or place or season that you miss deeply. Isn't it tempting to think? I know it's tempting for me to think this at times. Isn't it tempting to see that picture and to think, you know, I just need to get back there. (laughs) I just need to get back to where I once was, and then I'll be happy again. Did you know that this is a lie? (sighs) No, this is the cruel lie of nostalgia. What does nostalgia say? Nostalgia says your greatest joys are behind you. Your true home is behind you. You just need to get back to where you once were. And do you see how cruel this is? Because none of us can go back there. Nostalgia says your greatest joys are behind. You need to get back to where you once were. The gospel, praise God, says your greatest joys are ahead. Have faith. Don't give up. Keep going. The best is yet to come. How do we combat nostalgia's lies? We combat nostalgia's lies in two ways. Number one, earnestly thank God for the sweet times of the past. When you see that and think about that, earnestly thank God for that. But secondly, remember that the sweetest moments of life are mere appetizers of what is to come. As C.S. Lewis put it, there are far better things ahead than anything we have left behind. The eternal home for which we long is not behind us, it's ahead of us. And the cornerstone of that home, according to this text, is Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is the home for which your soul longs today. Colossians 1.16 says that all things, including us, were created through Christ and for Christ, meaning Our hearts and our souls were created for Christ in the same way a fish was created for water. Jesus is the home for which we were created. And Jesus gave up the comforts of his own home in heaven to come down to this earth to die for us. And then he rose again on the third day to prepare an eternal home for us in him. And today, Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. Will you open up the door and receive him? If you are new here or you're just exploring Christianity or you are interested in a relationship with Jesus, would you join me in this prayer now? And let's all pray this together now. Lord Jesus, I long to have an eternal home, one of permanent love and joy without sin and suffering. Lord, Forgive me. Forgive me for looking everywhere but you to find this home. Everything in this world is frail and temporary, but you, Lord Jesus, you are unfailing and eternal. Lord Jesus, make your home in me today so that I can find an eternal home in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In all of our hardships, we never suffer alone. And today, at the Lord's table, we remember that our Savior, Jesus Christ, suffered and died on the cross for us and for our sins. And by the way, if you didn't get a communion uh, cup, just raise your hand and we'll have an usher bring one to you. In communion, we do not just look back at Christ's death and his resurrection, but we also look forward to the day when he returns to bring the ultimate resurrection and homecoming celebration. And on that day, our souls will finally experience the home for which they were created. Just a reminder, you do not need to be a member of Chapel Street in order to enjoy this meal. Uh, This is the Lord's table, not Chapel Street's table. Meaning if you are trusting in Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, no matter what your background is, this meal is for you. If you have not yet put faith in Christ, I would encourage you to use this time, instead of taking the meal, use this time to cry out to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, my soul longs for a home. Come and make your home in me so that I can find my eternal home 
in you. Pray that prayer to him. Cry out to him and he will receive you. But for all of us, let's let this meal be a reminder that just as certainly as you can see and feel this bread and cup, so certainly will Jesus return in the flesh to bring salvation to all of those who are eagerly waiting for him. Now, if you would open up the the bread, hear the words of institution. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. (laughs) Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take together. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again in glory. Amen. A perfect line to end on till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Jesus said in John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Church, go today in the joy of this hope and love one another, your true eternal family as you go. Amen.